Hello and welcome to our webinar about the Formula One aerodynamics by SimScale. My name is Milad and I'm very happy that so many of you joined today. And yes, uh, in the course of this webinar you will learn a lot about how aerodynamics is used in F1, uh, which impact aerodynamics has on the lap time and also what will change or what have changed this year and how this will affect the aerodynamic of the cars. First of all, before we start to dive in, I would like to make sure that everybody can hear us loud and clearly. Uh, guys, yes, there's a button inside this GoToWebinar app which we are using to broadcast this webinar called Raise My Hand. In the case you can hear me loud and clearly, click, cl click this button and I know that everything is working fine. Great, I see a lot of fans. Seems like everything is working. In the case, for some reasons, the quality should drop, for example. You can also use our toll-free audio service numbers. Uh, on this, your screen, you will find right now uh, different numbers for different countries in Europe and also from the, for the US. And if you want to use this toll-free audio service, just dial this number and enter once you ask the access code you can see also on the slide. Great, then let's take a look at our today's agenda. And um, first of all, we will uh, start with some basic definitions of race car aerodynamics. And uh, during the first part of this webinar, you will learn everything about the role of aerodynamics in F1. So uh, we have a, a guest speaker today. I'm very happy that you will join Tobion Larson. I'm just going to introduce you in some seconds. and. Uh, he will really go with, with you through the, all the important topics like role of aerodynamics and also which tools are used. In the second part, we will talk about the recent regulation changes. And in the beginning, we will take a look at the changes in detail. And after that, we have prepared some nice fl fluid flow simulations, some CFD simulations, which should underline the difference between 2016 and 2017 Formula 1 car. And we will together went through the simulation results and discuss them. And finally, we have also prepared some resources for you to get started yourself with CFD of Formula 1 racing. And we will just crisp talk about the idea of CFD, how you can use the SimScale free simulation platform to run your own CFD simulation of a front wing. And finally, we will have a Q&A where you can ask all your questions about aerodynamics and race cars. Just to make sure that um, everybody knows how this webinar works, I have uh, just a few words about the idea of our webinars and workshops. So as I mentioned, we want to give you some insights into the world of race car aerodynamics and also some hands-on experience with CFD simulation. Therefore, we cannot focus so much on simulation theory. And if you really want to understand, let's say, the fundamentals of CFD, we have some other nice learning resources, which you will find in our forum. And uh, right now, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you to our today's guest speaker, Torbjörn Larsson. Torbjörn is uh, really a veteran in the field of race car dynamics and race car CFD. He started his career 15 years back at BMW Sauber, and there he was responsible for creating the CFD department, and he took the same role as, at BMW F1 and Ferrari F1 Racing. Today, Torbjörn is working as a consultant for CAE at Creo. And uh, yes, I'm very happy that you joined today. Uh, Torbjörn, um, I will just make you the presenter right now, and then uh, the stage is yours. OK. So I hope everyone can hear me now. Uh, thanks a lot, Mina, for inviting me to this online event and, and for letting us all get some very interesting insights, I'm sure, in about this year's Formula One course. Uh, uh, as Mila said, my name is Torben Larsson, and I have spent uh, a large portion of my professional career in Formula One, uh, and my focus has always been on aerodynamics and CFD methods, uh, even while I'm working outside of, of, of F1. Uh, so. Let me start by, by getting back in time a little bit, uh, uh, a quick look. Formula One has been around for, for 
quite some time. Uh, started already in, in the 1950s and has always been considered the, the, the pinnacle of, of model sports. Uh, representing the series of, of, of really the fastest and most technical advanced racing cars. Uh, and, and over the years, I mean, the, the complexity and the looks of the car have changed dramatically, although we, we can certainly kind of identify a common theme if, if you look at the cars here on, on display. They, they are all kind of uh, following this, the definition of a Formula car, which is like an open wheel race car where you have a bodywork being sculpted uh, for aerodynamic efficiency, really. Uh, and, and really what, what, what uh, Formula One, we have to understand, is a highly regulated sport. And, and, uh, and the dimensions of the car are, are basically uh, dictated by, by the rule makers, by the FIA. Uh, sorry, I had a little bit of a problem here with my, my screen, but um, so, so there are many rules defining the, the layout and, and, and the dimensions of the car and, and areas where you are allowed to put body work and other areas where you're not allowed to put body work. And when it comes to then to, to the detail shaping of, of the car, that is really, really driven by primarily by the aerodynamic efficiency. And, and, and it doesn't really matter how a car looks. It, it may look ugly as long as it's fast. That, that's really the beauty of Formula One. Um, so, but before getting into details, I think we need to kind of define a little bit about uh, so, some basics here. We will be talking a lot about aerodynamic downforce and aerodynamic drag throughout this web webinar. So I would like to kind of be very clear and try to illustrate what we mean when we, we refer to downforce and drag. And basically here, downforce is what we're illustrating with the, with the blue arrows. So this is the vertical force that is uh, basically pressing the tires to, to, the, to the ground to, to create uh, additional grip. So we are illustrated here with, with, with a kind of a distribution between the front and the rear and the middle of the car. Uh, and the drag, which here is represented by the red arrow, that is really the, the air resistance that the car must overcome to be able to accelerate forwards. Uh, so, so these are forces measured in, in, in Newtons, obviously, and, and they vary with speed, obviously. The faster we go, typically, the, the higher the forces become. Uh, so in a way, it's much more practical to, to introduce dimensionless numbers, so coefficient of drag and coefficient of downforce. And when we say here CX, which is then the drag coefficient, what that means is that we, we take the, 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 the force in the X direction and we normalize it with a reference pressure and a reference area. So Q here is really the dynamic head in the free stream where we have a velocity V entering, which is really the speed of the car. And A is our reference area, which is typically the, the projected the frontal area of the car. And then we use the same, obviously, the same reference numbers for the vertical uh, downforce coefficient that we call here C Z or. Um, and then we also talk a lot about aerodynamic efficiency. And what that means, what that is really, is then the ratio of, of C Z over C X, so, so downforce over drag. That's also something that, that we, we're going to speak about a little bit. So now when, when, we, when we know what, we, what, what those kind of forces represent, uh, aerodynamic downforce and drag, uh, we can try to speculate then how much downforce can a modern F1 car generate and, and really how high is the drag. Well, as I said, obviously this depends on the many a lot of factors and obviously how fast the car is, is traveling. Uh, but again then, let's speak in terms of coefficients. Uh, uh, to see, uh, try to calculate the CX and CZ, or we'll try to estimate that. And um, what we will see that when, when we speak about downforce coefficient, it will be on the order of four, slightly above four. Uh, and the drag coefficient here, CX, would be on the order of one. Uh, and in F1, they often use the terminology points. So this would then mean that we have like 400 points of downforce or 100 points of drag. Uh, and quite often when they develop the cars and try to improve the performance to speak about how oh, we try to find a couple of points of downforce or 10 points of downforce, what does that mean? 
well, let, let, let's, let's think about that and let's talk about that a little bit in terms of lap time. How much is a point of Danforth worth in terms of lap time? Uh, because that's really what, what is interesting here. We don't care so much per se about how many points we have. We really care about how to reduce the, the, the lap time. Um, and again, this is obviously, as I said before, it's going to be dependent on a lot of factors. Obviously, it depends on how long a lap is, for sure. But uh, as a really crude rule of thumb, let's accept this, that if we can add about 10 points of downforce, we can probably estimate that that is going to reduce a lap time by three-tenths of a second. Doesn't sound a lot, maybe, but if you think about a qualifying lap, Three tenths of a second can, can be the difference from being on pole or, or being in the midfield, really. So, so we can say that 10 points of additional downforce is certainly something significant. It's worth to, to, to fight for, to find. And if we look at the drag then, well, I just want to illustrate it with a simple example of, of the, the rear wing DRS. So DRS stands for Drag Reduction System. So this was a device that was introduced already in 2011, I believe, and was kind of a, a way to, to, to make overtaking easier. So what, what it is, is basically that the upper flap on the rear wing is movable. So at, at certain conditions, uh, they, they allow, the, the driver is allowed to, to move the upper element of, 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 the, of, of the rear wing, which we see here to the left where, where the flap has moved up. And what, what happened then is that you're going to, basically stall the rear wing. The rear wing is going to lose a lot of its downforce. And with that goes also a lot of drag. The, the, the rear wing produces a lot of, in, as we call, induced drag, lift-induced drag. And, and when, we, when we stall the wing, we, we drop the downforce, and we're going to also lose a lot of drag. And this is a way then to, to uh, increase the top speed uh, on, the, on the long straight, obviously. And we can estimate that by doing this, we, we, we are losing losing on the order of five, six points of drag probably. And we can easily see if we match the top speed at the end of the straight that they probably increase the speed by 10 or even maybe 15 kilometers an hour. So that gives you kind of an, an appreciation for what those points are worth, points of downforce and drag uh, in terms of lap time. So uh, what then? What, what kind of tools do we have then to develop the car to find this aero performance? Well, uh, th there, there are different tools, and, and traditionally, Formula One was a lot about track testing. Uh, today, track t testing is uh, is really very very limited, and it's uh, and you're basically only allowed to test at some a few occasions during preseason. Uh, whereas during the season, then, then you're basically testing is basically banned, and, and and you're relying heavily on wind tunnel testing and and computer simulations. But uh, as we should see soon, even um, CFD and wind tunnel testing have become very restrictive in recent years, and, and and the reason for this is also that they want to try to keep the cost down. So. Since this is about, um, really, this webinar is really about CFD, I'm, I'm not going to spend any time on discuss about wind tunnel testing or track testing, but I just want to go through a little bit what has happened in terms of CFD within Formula One. Uh, Formula One, they were really early adopters of, of simulation technologies. Already in the early 1990s, they started to do use some, some some tools for, for, for designing wings and cooler ducts, and, and that was basically Invisible panel methods and so on, but then about 20 years ago, something like that, uh, the kind of RANS methods that are offered to you today were introduced uh, in Formula One, but but really not to the refinement levels that that you can get today through through, through companies like SimScale. Uh, but then maybe in, in 2005, then the really the high performance computing era took place in Formula One. And uh, Sauber was one of the teams that they were really pioneering this. They, they were pushing hard to, to introduce um, large-scale simulation, and, and then they introduced one of the first sort of supercomputers in Formula One that was named Albert at the time. And, and other teams were not uh, late to follow in, in, in this kind of trend. And, and then f during a couple of years, uh, there was really a kind of a, a a competition between the teams who had the, the biggest computers and who can run the most simulations and so on. 
Uh, but then uh, in 2009, they, they agreed that, that uh, well, we have to put some limitations also on, on safety simulations. So, so the, the teams were not uh, at that point allowed to use unlimited resources in terms of CFD. Uh, but still, I think it's fair to say, if, if we look back um, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, Formula One has really acted as a catalyst in developing uh, CFD methodology and, and new CFD tools. They were really early adopters of, of, of simulation um, technology, and they helped to push, you know, uh, the technology to, to, to be able to, to simulate a very large and complex model um, leading to like parallel efficiency in both, both meshing tools, solvers and post-processing tools. And, and they really became advanced users of, of high-performance compute, computers early on. And if we look at this chart to the right, which is kind of an interesting chart, this is the top 500 list, so representing the, the 500 fastest supercomputer in the world. So on, on the horizontal axis, we have the year, uh, and then uh, on, the, on the vertical axis, we have performance in, in flops. And the vertical axis is actually a logarithmic scale here. So we go from megaflops, gigaflops, teraflops, and petaflops, and so on. And, and, the, and the golden line would represent the fastest computer in the world at, at the time. Uh, and, and the blue line would be the, 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 the computer on, on place 500. And if you look for 10 years ago, we see these red dots, the Formula One teams, they were well on the top 500 list. Some of the teams were. Uh, but then because of all that restrictions that came in, sorry, I'm, I'm lost connection here. My, my the screen is not updating. You know, can you can you support me? Maybe my, my slide is not advancing. <laughs> I'm sorry for this. Try to click on the PowerPoint icon first. The taskbar. You click you have to click the wallpaper because yeah, it's not click again on it. Okay. So I'm there again, sorry, yeah. So in, in 2009, when we had those new rules, so that was really a limit in terms of Teraflop that the teams could use, so they kind of fell off the scale at, at the point. But still, they are really pushing the technology so that they're up there and, and, and pushing software and hardware vendors very, very hard. Um, so then, uh, let me then uh, say a few words about aero development strategies. I mean, this is it's a broad topic and I can only, uh, very say something very little about that, but uh, in terms of, of, of developing the, the aerodynamics uh, performance of the car, uh, there are different different routes and strategies to take, and it's not obvious what, what would be the best in each situation. Uh, if you were go to to say finding maximum downforce, or you want to minimize the drag, or is it the, the, the ratio downforce to drag this is important, or perhaps there are some other measures you have to consider, like some sensitivity to, to roll, steer, angle, or, or things like that, or the balance of the car. Um, so at the end of the day, the, the, the ideal configuration would depend on, on many factors, such, such as the driver's performance and, and, and the lap, the track layout, and so on. If you think about Monaco, for instance, which is a, a street race, then the maximum downforce is really, really important, and, and, and drag is of less importance. On the other hand, if we go to Monza, which is, is a, a, low, a low downforce track, then low drag becomes very, very important because you need high top speed. Um, but at the end of the day, you need to, to evaluate the car at, at, at different, what we call operating points. And those operating points can then represent the, the, um, the car traveling through a corner, the car braking before a corner or exiting a corner and so on. And then the, 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 the magic comes in how, how do you weight those operating points together. So, we try to find kind of a merit performance number where we combined various operating conditions and then we had to find a good weighting. And this is the number that we try to, to, to minimize or maximize uh, depending on what, what we want to do. And th this is really where, where the knowledge and the know-how of, of the engineers comes to play. And obviously, as I said, depending on how the track looks, that kind of uh, optimization uh, 
exercise could, could be different. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say then, then if, 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 if we have rules that have been stable for a while, which we don't have this year, we have new rules, so, so the, the cars are initially quite different. But with time, if the rule doesn't change, we, the tendency would be that kind of nature would drive the cars to very similar shapes and they would be, become more and more efficient in terms of their dynamics. So, so really what it means then uh, during a season when, when, the, when the teams start to, to refine the design, it's really about a continuous and what we call incremental design evolution. So they make small steps of improvements to, 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 to add some extra performance to the cars to find a couple of points to, to, to improve the, the, the aerodynamics. Uh, and the other things to consider then that this is really taking place, uh, this kind of development is really taking place at a very high pace w during the season where we on average have, have a race every second weekend. And at least the bigger teams, they, they always have something new on the car for each race. Uh, and what I would like to, to, to say here then, stress then, is if, if we have a car that is already very, very highly developed and sophisticated, to find those 10 points that we were speaking about before, which was uh, said worth about three tenths of a second, that is nothing you find overnight. That typically requires many man months of development work. Uh, and, and what does this mean then for CFD? If we think about the CFD workflow and, and uh, we want to use CFD to, to, have, to make a difference, to have an influence. But first of all, as, as, as I just said, the development pace is very, very high. That means that you have to be very efficient with your CFD process. You, you don't have much time to have an influence to develop a new, a new component or evaluate a new component. So you need very short turnaround times. And the other thing is, is this kind of incremental design approach with, with which really makes a challenge because we have to have sufficient accuracy and fidel, fide, fidelity in the results uh, so we can pick up at least the correct trends because Typically what's going to happen, we will make a sequences of very small design changes and hopefully they would add together. So we can expect that the difference from one simulation to another in terms of results can be quite small. But still we need that kind of high accuracy to, to, to be able to, to pick up the strand. And then if, we, if we're going to do this kind of error mapping, as I said, where we have to evaluate the car, not at, at one condition, maybe at 10 different conditions, well, then we have to be very efficient in setting up new models and, and process the data. Okay, so that was kind of the introduction, introduction and a little bit of the background. Now I think we're coming to the 2017 cars and, and the new regulation. And I think now, Mina, you take over, right? With yes, exactly. Slides. I think you can just stay the pro, uh, moderator, Torbjörn, as just a few slides. Yes, thank you okay. very much, Turbion, first of all, for this great introduction. And uh, guys, uh, if you have questions which you would like to ask Turbion, just write them into the question box and we will try to discuss all of them, if the time allows us to, during the Q&A. And yes, this was the first part of the webinar. And right now, let's make a step forward and take a look about the uh, let's take a look on the massive regulation change uh, this year. Torbjörn, you already mentioned that um, uh, every time where this is such a, a revolution in terms of regulations, a lot of new design approaches can be, uh, can be seen on track and during the time they will converge more and more. And, and uh, yes, first of all, let's take a look what exactly happened and how the regulation changed. So, Torbjörn, maybe you can go on the next slide. And these slides give you a very good overview. Here you can see on the left side a generic 2016 F1 car, which is, yes, gray, and on the right side a red F1 car following the current technical regulations. And um, first of all, if we take a look, we can put it in a nutshell and say the car become much wider, much flatter, and they look also more aggressive if you want to take about the aesthetics of the car. But we are interested in the technical data. So let's go a little bit further and first of all take a look at the next slide where you can see how the front wing changed. Here you can see both cars from the top and again on the left side the 2016 car, on the right side the 2017 car. And the first thing which is obvious which we can see is that 
the front tires and the front wing are much wider. So the front wing was increased by 200 millimeter width and the front tire changed from 245 millimeter to 305 millimeters. And um, what is very important, I think, here is um, that we also, what we can also see is that basically not only um, the, the um, width changed of the front wing, but also, um, let's say, a little bit the proportions, because the wing is, uh, has now a little bit different shape, which we can see on the next slide. There we will take a look at the cars from above, and here you can see what happened. The wing was not only uh, increased uh, in terms of, of the um, length and the widthness, but also um, uh, the, the shape uh, changed, and it's now the front wing is now somehow swept back together with the side part. Um, you can really see the line is now a swept line. And also what have changed is the floor. The floor is now two meters wide. And also we increased the, the uh, wide of the, of the rear wings, uh, rear wheels, sorry, from 325 to 405 millimeters. And the rear wing is also wider and mounted much rearwards. Another uh, very important regulation change is affecting the design zones. Within this technical regulations, there are s something like zones, virtual boxes, and inside these virtual boxes, for example, you are allowed to, to add winglets or wings or not. And uh, one major change was that from this season on, there is much more freedom uh, in this area uh, b b b b in between the barge boards and the side pod leading edge. So last year, for example, they were not allowed to use la very large barge boards. And in contrast to that, this year they have much more freedom, and that's the reason why all the teams added this uh, very big barge boards in front of the side pod. And um, we can should also take a look at the diffuser and the underflow, which we can see on the next slide. And this is also, I think, a major regulation change. Here again, you can see uh, how the size and the position of the rear wing was changed. So on the left side, we have the 2016 model. The rear wing is, is uh, not very wide and much higher. In contrast to that, the uh, new cars have lower rear wings. And if you take a look at the diffuser, uh, the expansion increased, which means uh, uh, we have not we have changed the height of the diffuser profile, and therefore the air will much more uh, expand, and this will in theory and also in practice add additional downforce to the race car. And now I think we can take a look at the CFD results. And maybe Torbjorn, since you're all CFD experts, you can. Uh, <laughs> Uh, tell us what we can see here. Okay, uh, well, yeah, let, let's try. I think this is probably the most exciting part of the, of the webinar, at least for me. I mean, this is new to me. And, and I really got an opportunity to see some results from a 2017 compliant uh, car uh, for, for, for the first time. Uh, and we're going to look for a couple of slices here that Milad has, has prepared and, and his colleagues. And what we're going to see is on, on the right-hand side, we will see the new car. And on the left-hand side, we will see the see the old car, and and, and we, we go directly to the most secret and most revealing part of the car, which is the underside, and this is really where most of the downforce gets created, and and what we're presenting here in, in the picture is is basically static pressure or the coefficient of pressure, uh, so, so so and 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 uh, what it means here is is that blue colors represent low pressures and and the red colors represent uh, 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 high pressure. So anything blue or, or, or greenish in, in, in those pictures here you see here uh, will uh, generate downforce. So, so remember force is basically static pressure times, times surface area, and that would create the force normal to the surface, right? So, so what we can see here, the, the first really obvious thing to notice now is that uh, as we have a much wider car, <clears throat> the area of the floor is much larger than the new car. Uh, and the diffuser is also the starts the, the kick line here of the diffuser starts earlier, and, and the height of the diffuser is is also taller, and, and it's very obvious that we see this deep blue area here at the back of the car that this this diffuser is working much harder. 
Also interesting to notice is, is the say this leading edge area of the car. This is really the entrance of, of the floor and this is really one of the key areas to develop. <coughs> and here again we see these streaks of blue pressure in, in the indicating uh, downforce. But they also kind of revealing that we have some structures here. If, if we look at the shape here, this, this blue kind of streak, that is kind of an indication that there is a kind of a flow structure coming here. Uh, and probably it, it is a strong vortex with low pressure in its core that is producing this. Uh, so, so as Milan said, with the new regulation, we have these additional devices in this region where we, we can manage the flow. And I, I think we will see that in some of the other pictures as well. And that is a, a very important area. And obviously we also see that the front wing is generating a fair amount of downforce and also we can see uh, the, the bottom surface of the rear wing on, on, the, on the new car here. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting, um, very revealing picture that we have a clear, already here a clear indication that the new car is, is going to generate a fair amount of more downforce than the older one. Uh, but let's move to, to, to the next kind of uh, revealing results. So this, <coughs> now, it's a, now we're looking at, at the vertical cut plane through the, the front of the car. So we're cutting through the, 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 the front wing and, and the chassis. And now instead of looking at static pressure we're looking at total pressure total pressure is a static pressure plus the dynamic head of the flow and, and so it basically represents the energy of the flow so red means that that we have kind of a free stream condition where we are not losing any energy of the flow and and where we see other colors there are something going on in in the flow field <coughs> and here we can clearly see a lot of structure propagating off the front wing uh, when we see the kind of circular blobs here, they are traces of vortices. They are all, all traces of vortices. And, and we can see a very complex scenario here of, of, of things happening. Uh, and pointing out here is, is what we call the Y250 vortex. It, it was there already before and, and it's, it looks even stronger here on the new car. And what is the Y250 vortex? Well, it is that like at, at the central portion of the wing, you, you, you are supposed to have a neutral section, so you cannot generate any downforce from the central portion. This is stipulated by the rules. But at, at, at 250 millimeter off the center line, you are allowed to, to construct the proper wing. So that kind of in, introduces a discontinuity of, of, of your wing loading. And at that, that position, there will be a very strong vortex that, that sheds off of, 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 of the front wing. And that's what we see here in, 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 in that little blue blobs here. And we will also see it later on further downstream. So another thing to, to kind of observe here is that, as I said, that there is a lot of structures. Uh, so, so we can imagine that the flow behind the front wing is, is quite complicated, it's quite complex. And uh, obviously the front wing is there in the first place to generate front downforce to balance the car properly. <clears throat> However, that kind of uh, the amount of downforce you need to, to balance the car, you could easily achieve it with a much, much simpler front wing. You don't really need all those devices and all those elements. So they are there for another reason. They are there to, to manage the flow, basically. So because the front wing is the first thing that sees the flow, and the front wing will condition the flow downstream, condition the flow to, to, the, to, the, to the underbody, and it would also use the front wing to try to manage the tire wakes. And that's why those wings tend to become very, very complicated. So if we move further downstream, now we are, we are cutting through the car uh, at the side port leading edge, so just at the entrance of, of, the, of the floor, just before the entrance of the floor, basically. And what we see here, in these kind of greenish blobs, these are the traces of the front tire wakes. And we can see they look kind of similar, but as you can imagine, on, on the new car, they, they are a bit wider, a bit taller, because we have much wider tires. The other interesting thing now to observe is that in this region, in, in, in the sideboard leading edge area, now, since we are allowed to put devices here, which we weren't before, we can start to, 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 to play with those and introduce flow structures, and we can try to to use them to create new vortices, or we can try to use them to steer away the tire wakes and so on. And this will certainly be an area where the team will spend a lot of time, a lot of effort to, to develop this to their advantage. Uh, so, so we can already here see with, with this kind of the first attempt of devices, we, we are creating some very fairly strong flow structures here, 
which are not uh, uh, there in, in, in the old car. Uh, and this here is also again, uh, we see our friend the Y250 Vortex traveling downstream and kind of uh, interacting with the front tire wake. And here it's probably, it, it probably gets split by this uh, barge board deflector here somehow. So we can already see at, at this stage that the flow is quite different between the old and the new car. Let's move further back then to the diffuser area. So now we're cutting through the, the rear tires and, and the rear wing. And, and notice here that on, on, on the new car, we don't really see the rear wing because the rear wing sits further back. But also notice that the, the diffuser is quite a bit taller than on, on the previous year. And this is, this is really one of the key areas in terms of development <laughs> to find performance from the diffuser. Unfortunately, it's also one of the most difficult areas to develop. Uh, it's very difficult to simulate in CFD, but it's also very difficult to simulate in the wind tunnel because here we have this reading is, is highly unsteady. It's, it's affected by the, of the rest of the car from the front wing and downstream. What, what happens there will affect the performance in the diffuser. And also the, diff, the diffuser sits close to the ground and very close to the tire. So the interaction with the tire, tire is made of rubber, it will change its, its shape, its position. We will have kind of a dynamic state. Uh, and, and basically what I'm trying to say that what we're simulating here, what we're presenting here, uh, are results based on steady state simulation. So, so we don't get the whole picture, but at least we get kind of the topology. It gives us an idea of what could be happening, but in real life, things are moving around, things are, for, are, are very dynamic. But um, interesting to see here, at least on, on, on the new car, we have this uh, quite large blue structures which are sort of indication of, of uh, vortices going off from the diffuser. Uh, and then this is an area where the team will spend a lot of efforts because what could happen is that uh, because of the tire sitting very close to the diffuser, there will be kind of a, a vortex coming from the, the, the contact patch where the tire meets the ground. And that vortex you don't want to suck into the diffuser because you would lose a lot of performance. So, so they will try to find all kinds of tricks to avoid that, to kind of seal off the diffuser from, from the tire wake and so on. Uh, but it's an area where, where there is a lot of performance to, to be gained. Uh, let's move on and see what we have more. Well, we can also look at the car uh, slicing through the center line, again, uh, looking at, at total pressure. And probably what is most obvious here that, is that uh, we see that now that the new the new car, the, the rear wing sits much lower than, than in previous years. So the rear wing doesn't really see as much clean air as it used to, to do. Uh, but the other interesting thing to consider with this, since the, the rear wing is lower, uh, the, the diffuser is, is becoming larger. The interaction between the, the rear wing and the diffuser is going to be stronger. They, they are more coupled than they used to be. And that's also an interesting uh, aspect to consider. Uh, let's see what we have here. So we have a horizontal cut again of total pressure uh, slicing through the, the, the lower portion of the car. Uh, we Again, we see the, the traces of the Y250 vortex here and here as well. Uh, you can notice with, with, with the wider tire that the wake of the tires is, is it's a fair bit larger than it was before. But also, since we have a wider car overall, we can see that the the kind of the footprint of the car, if you know, if you like, uh, the total wake behind the car is is quite a bit wider. Uh, that's kind of obvious on this picture, and we also see the rear tire wakes are are bigger than, than it used to be. So this is kind of an ind indication that that is, is probably uh, going to be more difficult to follow the new cars than, than the older ones, and I get into that in in in, in a second. Um, well, if, if we take all these results now and, and try to integrate the pressures, we get forces. Um, so let, let's just quickly compare here and, and, and uh, just to be, to be very clear, the numbers we, we were quoting here in, in Newtons would not be uh, very representative to the cars we, we see running on the track today because those cars are, are highly optimized. The, the team has been working on, on the design for, for probably over a year. So they, they will see much higher number in terms of downforce. They will see lower number in terms of drag. 
and, and so they will have a, quite a bit more efficiency than we see here. But but still, if we look at the trends, I think the trends are, are representative. So so what we see, for instance, if we start with the drag, we see a significant increase in drag. And this is really to be, expect, be expected because we have much wider tires and, and they, they shed a lot of drag. We are creating more downforce. With that comes also induced drag. If we see it in, in terms of downforce, we see quite a big increase, 36%, which I think is also kind of in the ballpark of what, what they were expecting with the new regulations. Uh, we can also see the distribution between front and rear downforce. So, so basically, the, the balance moves backwards, which means that we, we have we're producing more rear downforce than front, and, and that is also uh, agrees well what we see in the pictures where we have the, the deep blue area at the, at the back of the floor and, and, and the big diffuser. So it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, anyway, uh, a few, just a few slides here because uh, I asked Mila to produce some cut planes behind the car. Uh, as, as probably many of you are aware of, there have been some concerns about this new regulation that maybe it's going to be even more difficult to overtake to follow another car in the wake of, of, of the car and and what we saw now from the first race uh, we shouldn't do draw two, two firm conclusions but but um, it looks like overtaking was, was quite difficult uh, and, and a lot of the drivers complained that they, they could really feel the, the dirt air behind the, the car so making overtaking very difficult and a way to try to understand what's going on is again to look at this kind of total pressure contours behind the cars to see what happens with, with the wake of the car and I, this is a cap plane just just behind uh, 125 millimeters behind the car so so what what, what we can see here and it's very clear obvious from these pictures that uh, because of, of, of the the higher rear wing in, in the old regulations we, we can see that the effect of the, of the rear wing much higher up and and, and Whereas in the new car, the, the, the rear wing is actually closer to, to, to the bodywork, it's closer to the diffuser. And we will see this, as I said before, we will see a stronger interaction with the rear wing and the diff rear diffuser. These are some kind of traces from probably strong vortices getting out of the, of the rear diffuser. We can also see, because of the width of the car and, 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 and the wide tires, that the, 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 the wake close to the ground is quite a bit wider. Uh, with the new car. So if you move a little bit further downstream, we will see what happens, that the wake is kind of propagating downstream. Uh, this is kind of interesting, as we move further back, we will see on the old car that the wake is kind of racing upwards, because the, the rear wing is creating a lot of upwash, the rear wing sits higher up. Whereas with the new car, the rear wing is kind of working in, stronger together with, with the diffuser, and, and uh, Unfortunately, we don't have any cut planes further back than this. Now we're a bit more than a half a meter behind the car. But already here, we can see quite a difference. With the new car, the, 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 the wake sits much lower. Uh, and with the wake, I mean, this is the, the area where you lose energy, where you have a lot of turbulence. And, and if you think about a following car entering into this wake, he, he will lose a, a lot of performance. That, that, that is really very, very obvious. Uh, finally, here's, here's a picture of some ISO contours. Uh, I believe, again, not being sure, but maybe I can confirm that this is also total pressure. So you get kind of an appreciation for, for, the, for the flow around the car. You, you see the, the wakes of the tires and, and, and the wakes behind the car. But in order to hear, you get kind of an appreciation that it is more the wake on the new car here is more confined, it, it's lower. Uh, and the interaction again, as I said, with, with, the, with the rear diffuser appear to be stronger. So that, that would be very interesting now to, to, uh, to, to do some further analysis of this and, and also to look even further back how the wake propagates and, and, and so on. This can probably give you a, a good understanding on, on why overtaking is, is becoming difficult. Um, I think that's where I, I end today, and, and I hand back the word to, to, to Mila. I just want to say that uh, I think the results here that uh, Mila and his team has, has produced are, are very illustrative and, and very, very helpful in explaining how uh, modern race car works in terms of aerodynamics. So now, Mila, over to you again, I guess. Tobian, thank you very much, and <laughs> we already have a 
bunch of, of questions. And I would say we will talk about them soon in our Q&A. And right now, um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. And I think you all saw this nice images, uh, the CFD simulation results with turbine use to explain how aerodynamics of the cars will change. And right now, I have some good news for you guys because um, SimScale is a web based simulation platform where you actually can pr learn to perform this kind of simulation yourself for free. And I will just give you right now a very quick demonstration and show you how you can set up yourself a fluid flow simulation of the Formula 1 front wing. And first of all, since a lot of people asked, let's just quickly talk about what CFD is. So CFD stands for Computational Fluid Dynamics and in the end it's something like a virtual wind tunnel even more. With CFD you're able to simulate the behavior of any kinds of flow on a computer. So you can do aerodynamics but also hydrodynamics if you're interested and uh, CFD is based on a very smart approach. Basically there are some equations which are describing how air is moving but these kinds of equations unfortunately cannot be solved analytically which means there is no analytic solution known so far and if you're studying engineering you might know if you want to describe a flow field what you know need to know is the velocity of the air and the pressure of the air for every point. And so the idea of CFD is that we calculate the pressure and velocity distribution around an object, for example a rear wing which we can see here, um, by applying the uh, principle of conversation. What does this mean? The meaning is basically very simple. Just imagine we have this infinite small volume of, of, of flow. And then there would be a, some flow coming from the left side. And in the end, uh, what you can say is everything, the difference between all the flow, all the mass going in here and leaving the element here uh, is the rate of change of mass inside this volume. And you can do the same for momentum and even for energy. And uh, as long as you, for example, doing a steady state simulation, you know the rate of, of change needs to be zero. And then you can use these equations, you can solve them numerically, and you will get as a result the flow field around the car. But uh, you have to consider some things when you want to perform a CFD simulation. And the first thing is, um, uh, it's uh, basically the, the problem of using a computer because as you know computer have limited uh, memory and limited hard disk space and therefore we cannot solve these equations for the infinite number of points. Just imagine you have an unlimited number of points inside this fluid domain and if you would like to calculate these equations for all the points it would take you forever and therefore you have to uh, discretize your problem and divide this continuous problem into a discrete problem. And what we're doing here, it's called meshing. So we are dividing up the fluid domain around our wing in small cells. And we will only calculate the result of this equation for the center of each cell. And therefore we use a finer cells, finer mesh in the near of the wing and a causal mesh far away from the wing because we have higher changes of velocity and pressure in the near of the wall. And basically that how is, is how CFD is working. So we have a continuous problem, we're dividing it into discrete one by meshing and then we solve the equations. And typically this means you have three steps, pre-processing, simulation and post-processing. And uh, the pre-processing is where the part where you import your CAT model, for example, the front wing to sim scale and create the mesh. The second step, simulation, you define the boundary condition. That means you, you're telling in the end the software, where is the flow coming in, where is it coming out, and which speed is it taking. And finally, the last step is called post-processing. This is where we're going to visualize the results of our simulation. And now let's do this together. And uh, I have therefore prepared a simulation you can see here. And um, now, first of all, this is SimScale, our web-based simulation platform. And we can just take a look maybe at the SimScale website. 
and uh, you can re register here for free it's without any cost and just after your registration you can log in and start to do your own simulations and I have prepared a project right now which we can see here and later on we will send you via email a step-by-step -step tutorial also how to get this project including the geometry of the front wing and then you can set up such a kind of fluid flow simulation yourself and um, the first step is as you know the so-called meshing and what we have to do first of all here you see our geometry of a, of a, of a front wing and first of all we have to create a new new mesh select the geometry and then we can add a mesh operation and we have different kind of mesh operation with different analyzers and here we will use a parametric hex dominant for CFD and then basically what we have to do is to define the size of our virtual wind tunnel This is the size of our wind tunnel domain now. Hope you can all see it here. We will also add some refinement box around the wing, which we will refine later on. And you can define these boxes by give, just giving the coordinates of two opposite corners. Now we have here refinement around the mesh. And finally, we have to apply also a material point. And now we can just start to add mesh refinement. So we will add, first of all, the surface refinement here, which means that the size of all cells in the knee of the wing will be split at seven to eight times. We will add some other refinements, for example, for the boundary layer of the wing. And once we have defined all the refinements we need, we can just start the meshing operation, clicking on start, and the simulation will be carried out in the cloud. So nothing you are doing here is happening on your local computer. And since this meshing can take some time, I have already prepared a mesh. And here you can see if, uh, the mesh operation here was already finished. And the final results look like this. And if we hide these walls here, we can see that we have our front wing here. This is our front wing. And around you can see the mesh. And one thing which is very important, if we just take a look here, we made a symmetrical model since the symmetrical problem. And this is, for example, the structure of the mesh, a symmetrical plane. And here you can see basically how it works. We have this coarse mesh outside, we have this refinement zone in the near of the wing, and then directly on the surface, the mesh is massively refined. And this will give us a kind of good representation of the flow field. And the final step is to set up the simulation and um, Again, I have prepared this because it will take some time, maybe five to ten minutes. And first of all, so if you're going to create a mesh, uh, some new simulation, you have to choose analysis type. In this case, fluid dynamics incompressible. You have to choose the mesh. You have to define the material you want to simulate. In our case, it's air. It was taken from a material library. And then we defined the inlet. So the flow is entering the domain here with 60 meters per second, leaving the domain here. This wall is a symmetrical wall, and these two walls should not affect 
the arrow therefore there defined like a free stream wall with slip and the ground for sure is moving and the front wing is just a wall. We also added some result control items, a force item which means we will virtually measure the force of this, this wing and then we just have to start the simulation and after 35 minutes the simulation is finished and here you can see let's say the accuracy of your simulation with every iteration it's improving and in the end for example the average error of pressure of the simulation is smaller than E minus 4, which is fine, and then we can take a look at the 3D simulation results. For example, here I've prepared something, I have visualized the front wing, some streamlines, and the plane. And uh, Torbjorn, if you maybe want to give a comment on this, I think this is our old friend, the uh, Y250 Vortex, right? So the uh, structure Torbjorn um, showed us during his presentation can be also seen here. And here you see the flow is uh, reaching the wing, is split it up, and then when the two sides are matching again, we have this vortex was generated. And also in this pressure sli slice of, of static pressure behind the wing, you can see here and here this, this uh, low pressure areas. And I think this is the core of the vortex. And we can also do some other amazing things. So, for example, if we say we want to take a look, we can also hide the slice and the streamline. And then, for example, we can take a look at the pressure distribution. On the wing. We have just to the scalar for color bar sorry this was not was too much and um, what we can also do is for example move slices For example, here, we can change, for example, the representation to velocity instead of pressure. And then we can see, really, the wake generated by the front wing and we can also, for example, move it a little bit back. And you can also take a look at the forces of the front wing. Here you can see, for example, the pressure component of the downforce. We can see it here. Let's talk off all the other things we don't need. And for example, the pressure component of the drag is 18, nearly 80 kilogram. Right, and as I mentioned, the great thing is you can create such a simulation on your own with SimScale. And after this webinar, I think probably tomorrow we will send you an email including a link to the recording of this presentation and also a step-by-step -step tutorial. And I will, and this step-by-step -step tutorial will show you exactly how to create this kind of simulation on your own. And a lot of you asked us where we get the CAD model. And the CAD model for this simulation and the presentation, uh, we, get, uh, we took them from the Perrin project. You may hear about it. Nicholas Perrin is a former aerodynamist and racetrack engineer at Williams F1. And uh, he founded his a very interesting project called Perrin VR World and there he is developing together with hundreds of volunteers a Formula 1 race car. And you can access all his designs and cat fights for free.
And I would, if you're interested to join this project, you should definitely register yourself on www.perrin.com. And the great thing is that the whole company Perrin is not only owned by Nick, but also by the contributors. So if you join this project, you can become part of a, let's say, real F1 team. And it's a great resource, it's a great place to, to learn there and to get in touch with professionals. And yeah, thank you very much for staying here with us today. And right now, I think we have a lot of questions. Uh, most of them, I think, Tommy can only answer. And now I think we have some time left for our Q&A. Torbjorn, are you still here? I think you have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Great. <laughs> I'm here. Okay, perfect. We have more than 50 questions. I don't think we can discuss all of them, but <laughs> let's maybe start with the first ones. And the first question is... Um, Oh, the question was asked a lot of times. It's by Andre, and he is uh, studying mechanical engineering, and he wants to know uh, how hard is it for an aerospace engineer with a massive engineer degree to get a job on F1? Is it true that a PhD in aerodynamics is more or less required? Hmm. Uh, it's, it's a good question, an interesting question, and I, and I get it a lot of times, and I, I'm not sure I have a very good answer because... Uh, I don't think per se you need to have a PhD. Uh, you, you can certainly do with a master's and so on. Uh, the, the problem though that, that there are only so many places, uh, positions available in, in the Formula One for, for engineers and, and there are a lot of candidates. So uh, it's difficult to get a chance. I mean, and, and what do you do to, to, to get noticed? Uh, um, probably one, one good thing is, is if you involve yourself in some kind of student projects like, you know, Formula SAE or something like that, something that is relevant to the kind of uh, technology the F1 is interested in. And that, that's probably um, the best advice I, 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 can, I can give. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have a PhD, but I don't think it's really a strict requirement. Uh, um, end of the day, you, 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 uh, if, if you do something that feels very, very relevant to, to, to what they're looking for, that is probably more important. I'm, I'm sorry, it, it's a difficult question, so I don't have any, any super advice, really. <laughs> yes, for sure, but I think that's already good advice, and uh, <laughs> a lot of great competitions and serious projects where people can join and show how, because in the end, Tobin, I think it's about showing motiva motivation, right, and, and commitment. Yeah, it, it is not about passion, commitment, and motivations, you know, uh, um, for sure. Uh, it is, uh, and, and I think if, if you're involved in something like Formula SA, it, it's a good platform, and, and you get you you get exposed to to kind of the, that kind of environment a little bit, and that, that that's a good place to start, I think. Okay, perfect. The next question is by uh, Muhammad. Um, he wants to know uh, how can a small T wing applied by several teams gain the arrow advantage. So, sorry, can you repeat? He wants to I'm know sure. how the small T-wing applied by several teams uh, to the rear of the engine cover in front of the ah. wing. How this kind of wing can gain the arrow advantage? <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't really looked into the T-wing myself I, I'm, I'm, because I'm not involved directly in Formula One. I have not really been involved there, uh, so I can only speculate um, from from seeing some pictures of it. I think the wing by by it Self does not produce a lot of a lot of forces and so on. I, I think it's probably more the way how it conditions the flow to the to the rear of the car to the rear wing, and also maybe it, it can actually help the the, the shark fin itself. Uh, the shark fin is probably also there for, for some kind of cornering stability, probably also creating some lateral force during uh, cornering. Uh, so I think it's the kind of the combination with with the shark wing, T wing, and 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 what, what's how that conditions the, the rear wing. Uh, that, that's kind of a spec, speculation from my side. Uh, but I don't think it, it, it's a massive difference. I, I think they should get rid of it. <laughs> okay, great. Next question. Actually, a lot of questions related to um, this error mapping you talked about. And Rahul okay. wants to know, how do you correlate um, the map 
with let's say between racetrack and CFD and uh, yeah. how you weight or how you calculate the weight factors yeah I mean that, I think that's kind of the, the the secret how you calculate the weight, weight factors and I'm sure different teams will have kind of a different formula for this uh, uh, I mean in, in the wind tunnel it's relatively easy to, to, to set up the car in any kind of conditions and, and with a with a model motion system to, to kind of simulate the various say cornering conditions uh, I think what you have to do you have to analyze at the racetrack where the car spends most of its time uh, in what, what kind of ride height condition does the car see and that you, you can measure uh, with telemetry data from, from the racetrack and then you have to kind of evaluate where where it's spending the time and where can you gain or lose time uh, and those are the kind of conditions you need you should try to simulate in the wind tunnel and in CFD and, and try to optimize the performance at those kind of conditions where, where, where you have a good chance of, of gaining something one of the difficult things though with this is that since the tires are so influential in, in, in the performance and it's really very difficult to understand what, what is the actual shape of the tire in any given condition because for instance while, while you're cornering uh, the outside tire get pressed more to the ground than the in, inboard tire and then we have a very different kind of footprint uh, and, and the sidewall will look different and, and to understand uh, how they look in the first place and how they influence the aerodynamics is actually uh, very very difficult and and when you think about it a, a bit further uh, doing model scale testing you're not actually allowed to test the actual race car with its actual tires in the winter you have to produce a model with model tires even though they are made out of rubber uh, the loads will be different and, and the shape will not be the same so so that is also a bit where the secret lies to understand that and try to, to, to compensate for that and, and find a good correlation. So it's, it's, a, it's a million dollar question, but... <laughs> uh, All right. Yeah, I, I hope it made. So, yeah, I think it was, a, I think more than we could expect. I think it's ob <laughs> obvious that teams are solving these problems different. And there is another question by Raphael, mm. and he would like to ask why the transition on the central floor to the diffuser is discontinuous. Uh, he describes it as a kink and not continuous like in an old Group C race car. And what is the advantage of having this kind of uh, discontinuous transition between floor and diffuser? Uh, not sure how it looks today, again, since I'm not involved, but... but uh, part of the of this how the transition look is, is, is given by regulations uh, uh, that there are only so, there are some certain radius you have to, to obey and so on uh, and, and and teams typically play a lot with, with this uh, kick line as they call it and sometimes uh, there could be an advantage to be very aggressive in, in the kick line initially and, and even produce kind of a small separation so kind of a separation bubble and, and then you, you you recover the pressure at, at the back so you know it, it's all about finding performance and and uh, it could be that with, with sort of a say this continuous or very aggressive approach you can you can actually load up the diffuser a bit more uh, but but again this is a very difficult area so so and it really depends on how you set up the car how, how close you, you you're to the ground and what kind of rate you have in the car so so uh, th th there is a lot of things to consider, uh, for sure. But typ typically, what, what what happen is that you you, you create a, a strong suction peak at the kick line, and that sort of conditions the diffuser. Uh, for that reason, it could be good to have a kind of a sharp sharp start of it. Okay, all right. Then the question by Young. He wants to know if you still use 2D simulation, and if 2D simulation is still used in F1 for developing wing profiles, etc. Mm, I can I can only speculate, but I, I think it, to a certain extent, probably yes. When you start to draw things, you know, you typically start to draw something in 2D, and and, and there's still a lot of I think good things you can do with 2D. Uh, programs in terms of, of developing um, proper air force air force sections and so on and how they're supposed to work together so I, I think to some extent that they start in 2d and they, they loft that to a 3d wing you know where they add some 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 twist and a platform to it so uh, 
I mean, in, in the past, you 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 probably were were limited to, to only that, but today, it's not uh, that it's gone away completely. I, I think it still makes sense to 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 start off in two D for for certain things. Yes. Okay. Then this is one question related to me by Vivek. He wants to know what's the difference between SimScale and and existing stationary tools like uh, Star CCM or ISIM. Um, and yes, first of all, uh, to put it in a nutshell, SimScale is web-based, so you don't need to install anything, it's for free, you don't need any license, and basically we offer much functionality and the same things like all the other codes is doing. For sure there are some maybe specific types of analysis which we're not supporting right now, but if you're interested in that Vivek, you should just check out the SimScale website where you will find a detailed description of, of our features and simulation models. And um, then there is, uh, I think we can maybe make three or four more questions because time is running away. <laughs> and um, a question which was asked a lot is what is the total accuracy of, a CF, of CFD testing compared to wind tunnel testing or track testing? So how, how close are the results of this different mm. uh, ex experiment types uh, in reality? Yeah. Uh, I think we need a lot of time to answer that question, but <laughs> uh, it's it's a very good and very rele relevant question uh, because for sure that there are all, always correlation issues between CFD, wind tunnel, and track. Uh, end of the day, also the wind tunnel is just a simulation tool. But uh, but but uh, just to give you some kind of examples, if if we if we take uh, the loading of a front wing, uh, the loading of the rear wing. Today, with CFD, you can get very, very good predictions, very, very close. Uh, however, as I said also through the, through the webinar, if you start to do small design changes to the rear diffuser and, and to be able to, with, with, with great confidence, to predict that, it's, uh, it's going to be quite a challenge, both in CFD and the wind tunnel. Also, also for, the, for the sake of that, you, you don't actually really know the dynamics of the tires and how, how the car moves around. So, so, so certain things you can predict really, really, really well with CFD today. Uh, and typically, when, when you when you look at the topology of the, of the flow, um, it makes a lot of sense. That there are other things that are difficult to predict. Say in the in the wind tunnel, you cannot really simulate the effect of the of the engine of the of the hot air and so on, heating of tires and so on, uh, which you can do in in, in CFD. Uh, so, so even though CFD is getting better and better, uh, there are still things that are very, very difficult to predict. Uh, but in terms of forces on, on wings and other components, they are pretty accurate these days. All right. Paco wants to know if you are already using LES simulations in F1, or is it not possible yet from a technical point? It's certainly possible, and I, I think some teams probably are, are doing a, a bit of that. The problem, though, is not about the, let's say, the, the technology. That they are certainly capable of doing it. The problem is these limitations in, in teraflop, since they are not allowed any, anymore to use unlimited resources in terms of safety. They have to think carefully how to how to use the tools, uh, um, because an LS simulation consumes a lot of compute power compared to the so from from one LS simulation you can probably do hundreds of, of run simulations so you have to wait that you know uh, should I do a lot of uh, fast and cheap simulations or should I do one very very detailed and complex simulation and learn from that so uh, so, so to some extent they do the, those kind of simulations but not to the extent that they would like to do because they, they are limited in terms of teraflop consumption all right, Torbjörn, thank you very much for answering all the questions. I know, guys, you have a lot of more questions, but unfortunately, we're really running out of time, and the webinar is already nearly 20 minutes over time. Um, so, therefore, if you have some more questions, you can also write them into the SimScale forum, and we will try to answer them, uh, if we can. Uh, Torbjörn, thank you very much for being here with us today. It was a great pleasure to have you here. I think it was really a great presentation. I learned a lot. And also thank you all the guys for joining. Yeah, my pleasure, Mina. Thanks a lot for having me here. <laughs> yes, and Tobin, hopefully you will join us soon again for a webinar. I hope I can convince you. 
And, yeah, no, let's see. <laughs> and yes, uh, again, to everyone who joined, thank you very much. I will reach out to you tomorrow, send you an email with the recording of the webinar. Have a nice week and see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.